One plays drums, one plays two string slide bass, and one plays two saxophones at once. Together they call themselves morphine, and theirs is a sound unlike any other, as you're about to see. <laughs> slide bass and saxophone and drums? What the fuck is that? Low rock. Fuck rock, actually. That's what we call it. From the back of the room I hear a voice cry out Two string slide bass something good. Barry sax and drums we'll come on a little closer, let me see Really? Those guys may as well have been playing yeah, accordion, yeah, banjo a and bagpipes We've been trying to get them forever They have the most uh, distinctive sound I think in music a little closer, I got something to say yeah, come on. You had tapped into what was going on if you were at a morphine show. You see, I met a devil named Buena Buena. And since I met the devil, I've been the same. Oh, no. And I feel all right now, I have to tell you. I think it's time for me to finally introduce you to the boy. Critics across the country named the latest album by my next guest as one of the best of 1993. Here tonight from Boston to perform a song from Cure for Pain is Morphine. Mark's mystique really made the band's music and presence even more powerful. And because it's like, who is this man who seems like he's just out of time and out of place? Like, could be from the future, could be from the past. As close as we were, there was a whole realm of his life that I wasn't aware of. It's coming to me. Yeah, it's coming to me. Now I, I think there was a fascinating contradiction between how private he was and how intimately people felt connected. I know some people want to make a change. There was this sense that you did have to overcome a hurdle. You know, if you wanted to be into morphine, you weren't going to be able to pick up Rolling Stone and read a story about spending the night with them. You weren't going to be able to, you know, read a 5,000 word Q&A about Mark's past and about his family. Morphine. Front man of the band Morphine, Morphine Lord, Mark Sullivan, suffered a fatal heart attack on Saturday, July 3rd, while performing at a music festival near Rome, Italy. I haven't seen any other bassists do what he does. Um, unfortunately, I think they may have... Mark left this planet... Uh, a little premature and before they could really establish a really strong foothold. It was only after Palestrina that I started to try to figure out a little bit of who, what type of guy was this guy, you know? And, um, and he seemed like a real man. I also wanted to know how things worked and what family relationships were. He, was, he always liked family. You know, he was the oldest of the four kids. Hand over hand up the lifeline, luckily the night stays tight. Silhouettes of the two of us climbing. Mark, upset about Mark, mad about Mark. What are we going to do about Mark? 
It was uncomfortable, it was unpleasant, it was scary because we had three younger kids at home. He sort of wanted unconditional love and, and, and acceptance, that he didn't have to follow any rules or, or conventions, that he was being creative, he was an artist. And that was important in its own right, and that's, that's what we should respect. He could play music on weekends or evenings, and he should consider a real working job during the day. He didn't like that at all. So he offered him a choice. He could either get a job and go to work, or he could go back to college, we'd help him find a college who would accept him, or he could go. So he went. So he left in the middle of a blinding snowstorm. So it was a period of about six or seven years where we didn't know much where he was. We get postcards from. He was living in an abandoned miners' cabin. The Gold Nugget Saloon was our contact point. I don't know how he lived there. Uh, it must have been awful. I remember getting a card or two from Alaska. He was shrimping. He went off to San Francisco and then he worked in a tuna cannery. You're a bit of a fisherman, aren't you? I have fished before. Professionally? Professionally. And this is before you became a professional musician? Correct. Anywhere all through Central America, making... He spent some time in police, and from there he went on further into South America through Peru. He lost his passport at uh, Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu. In Central America where he was collecting mushrooms that had marijuana in them. He was doing something with mushrooms and marijuana. I don't know. Up this little makeshift band. Began to make him a name for himself as a musician there. He sent us an article. His whole adventure was so foreign to us that we, we didn't know how to treat him. Took a lot of guts, took a lot of spirit intelligence and he was searching I think while he was doing that. But he got sick in Brazil and that's why he came home. Better than yesterday and nothing like to do. Perhaps 800, all trying to climb it in Providence. We developed together the instrument I play. Mark already had his setup going, and uh, but it was a two. His was a two-string bass tuned to an A uh, on a bass, and he had a guitar version in his apartment, and I started playing with it, and then we broke out a, a box of strings and a pair of calipers, and we kind of like experimented and figured out the tension and all that stuff. I think what led to the formation of Supergroup was me just needing a place to live and Mark being um, very un-Mark-like and very generous. I mean, I don't mean that he wasn't generous, I just mean that he was a private person and he generously let me live with him. 
which was um, kind of a big deal. So in the process of living together, we just started jamming and playing songs. He saw the world as this big resource that he could soak up. I mean, beyond smoking pot and taking the, some mushrooms every once in a while and drinking, that was it, really. And the amount that he smoked uh, of the certain kind of weed he smoked, I mean, I would have one taste and I'd be psychotic for six hours. And he smoked, you know, 12 joints of that stuff in a day. So he was, his whole system was completely rewired by this intense weed that he smoked. He wasn't self-destructive at all. I think he was just looking for, looking to turn the world on a little brighter, you know, and, and, and feed his creativity that way. He was looking to sort of shine a light in dark places and, and go there and, and uh, mess around with poetry and music. Billy, let's play a little. We had uh, all been in rock bands and other things and we're all looking for something different and this was a good starting place for something different. Rita Wright was how I was first introduced to the genius that is Mark Sandman. We only ever played out under the name Trita Wright. We, you know, a typical thing, you make a list of names and everybody says, oh, I like that, I don't like that. And um, Mark liked that because um, he thought the women would like it. We have a million, like, little girls around that would just be like, oh. He was it, you know, he was king of cool. There was a uh, real magic to the guy. You know, I think she likes me, that's what I think. I think she likes me, that's what I think. With Trita Wright, we decided if we gave ourselves parameters, we would learn to be creative within those parameters, forcing creativity upon ourselves. Trita Wright actually stood out to me, you know, for one of the, I guess it was you know, partly because of the drum kit, that Billy was playing at the time, and, and you know, that it was so, it was pared down and simple, but in a way that was raw and somehow bluesy, even though it was popish. So one of the parameters we set was you have to be able to go to the gig, carry your gear in, in one trip by yourself. We will have no gear that requires two people to lift. Billy and I were in a, another band for a long time before Morphine, mm -hmm. called Treat Her Right, Treat La Bien, <laughs> as they say in some good, places. Good advice, men. <laughs> yes, words to live by. I asked a nice look, can I buy you a drink? You know, I think she likes me, that's what I think. I think she likes me, that's what I think. One night, I was out, <laughs> and he looked at me and went, hmm. And, and then he pursued me relentlessly for a couple of months, I think, right? Yeah. I, was, I was not very responsive, <laughs> which I think he liked. He liked the challenge. Sabine was a uh, little clueless at first, a little hesitant. Something happened. One day he was at the breakfast table. So you've been doing rock and roll in Boston for a while. What about this band? Why is this band different? What's different about it? It's good. Yeah? <laughs> Ended up actually starting to work with them as playing bass, with the group that became Treater Right. I kind of, at the time, I was doing less and less playing and more and more producing and recording. Yeah, I also got involved in a, a small A-track studio, which we did um, six of the nine songs there, a place called Fort Apache. It's a, a lot of big A-track studio. Oh, big A-track studio. <laughs> we did a couple of rehearsals, and I said, you know, I don't know, I think you guys really need a bass player. I think it's kind of cool if you don't have one, you know? This album, which was distributed in New England, uh, has now been picked up by a company in England as well. We 
wanted to do something different. We didn't want to be, you know, we didn't, we're not going to work in an office. Looked up at him, uh, at him as, as uh, kind of rock and roll older brothers. Yeah, Demon Records. Yeah. Demon Records. Yeah. They do, uh, over there they do Johnny Copeland and Robert Cray uh -huh. and uh, a lot of good, a lot of Elvis Costello stuff is on uh, Demon or Imp, which is another yeah. kind of name. Yeah, it seems like a really good label. You know, it was sort of like a, a collection of misfits in a way. You know, we're kind of like, oh sure, yeah, this is really going to happen, but um, the latest word today was they decided, they want us to add some more songs, they're going to do a new cover and so uh -huh. forth, so they gave us the go-ahead and they're... Uh, the check's in the mail. The check's in the mail. <laughs> we were estranged from our families, we wanted to do something different. People really rallied, everybody came together. And he would just be like, Linda, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be great. I'm going to be, I'm going to have a great band. I'm going to be a rock star someday. But by this time, you know, we were in our early 30s, and it's like <laughs> the clock is ticking. Thank you very much. We're going to bring our friend Dana Colley up here now to play a couple of songs on his baritone saxophone. We've got a microphone for him and everything. So uh, thanks for coming out. It's the middle of the afternoon, but... Feels like late at night somehow. Like we never went to bed. I remember the last time uh, they played at Jack's, which is right down the street that burned down. And it burned all night. Um, Treat All Right was on stage. The fire came out of nowhere. And they got out with their guitars. That was it. Then he started, you know, he started morphine. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't sulk. You know, he didn't quit. He started another project. At that time, Mark and I started jamming, and we, uh, he invited me up to his apartment on William Street in Cambridge. I was playing my one-string bass. Danny was playing his baritone sax. I got a head with wings, I got a head with wings. I got a head with wings. We got a drummer and... No, wait, we got a... We thought of a name, then we got a drummer and then we booked the show. Right. No, we thought of a name, booked the show, and then we got a drummer. You would not... But unfortunately, the end of 90 was when I first started to feel uh, I was having a problem with arthritis, sort of a stiffness. When Morphine started playing gigs and recorded good, basically Jerome recorded most of good. I played on some songs on good. And then Jerome started to develop, you know, he got sick. And that was sort of the beginning of the end of the whole thing for me, because it never, you know, they played for a while, Billy was filling in doing gigs, which to me made plenty of sense with the morphine connection, mean, excuse me, with the true to right connection. I got a head with, yeah. Oh. A head with wings.
playing it and recording, and Mark would record everything, and uh, you know, just always playing and coming up with ideas. Dana actually was a friend who was our roadie for one tour, and he used to play saxophone with us occasionally. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of Dana, and I, I always wanted to to have a different band just with Dana. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we do it. And it was really fearless. We, we were not afraid to play a song we didn't know very well. If it was a riff we worked on, no problem, let's give it a go. And at that time, Ryko Disc was, um, had made a mark for reissuing a lot of old vinyl. And they must have got a hold of uh, either a good or our prototype for Cure for Pain, and they offered us pretty much what it amounted to being a distribution deal. God, I knock on wood and pray with all I've got. Cross my bow with a cannonball, I see the writing on the wall. Hey! And he came to me and he's like, well, you know, I, I really need a manager. You know, it's a lot harder than I thought. He goes, I can't do this on my own and I need your help. Go and what to do, yeah, who to dog, who to ride and who to hold. And he really didn't want to hire a big New York or L.A. manager. He goes, I don't want a big New York manager. I don't want an L.A. manager. I, you, you know, you can't get them on the phone, and then once you do, you don't even really want to talk to them anyway, so I want to talk to you, Deb. During the U.S., morphine was indeed a pain-free experience for the concert goers we spoke to. A couple weeks into it, it's like every single show was selling out in advance, and it was just becoming like this real intense buzz thing, like, oh my god, you've got to go see this band, and then when people saw them play live, it just blew their minds, because it's, there's three guys on stage you know, no guitar, and it's making this incredible sound. The combination of the baritone sax and, and the bass is just, it's crazy. I've never seen anybody play two saxophones at once, but it's incredible. I can't think of another band that sounds like them. That's one of the reason I like them. And things really started to take off, so, you know, we knew we had something good. And they went to Europe and it was just, you know, the same thing. Just, you know, people going crazy and, you know, selling out shows. And Mary, won't you come? Mary, won't you come? Mary, won't you come? We weren't really ready for it in a way. We just didn't expect it. So when it happened, it was like, wow. To me, it was like, oh my God, here's somebody that's taken this whole beat thing, you know, Ferlinghetti and Ginsberg and Kierwack, and brought it forward into the present. Ils sont ce soir à nulle part ailleurs. Morphine! I mean, those three cats were just so badass. Yeah, how has the tour been so far for you guys? Uh, we killed them. You killed them? Billy and Dana and Mark together it was amazing chemistry. And drums together, you'd expect it to sound like a complete and utter shed. Somehow, with our next guest, it sounds fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Morphine. We'll be right back with the Burton Animal Las Vegas. 
much for being here tonight, man.